there's just constant reference to lol sniffing <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this um Hi there, my name is Catherine. I hope you're doing well. I am editing this video right now and I just realized I never filmed an intro for it. So I'm just gonna really briefly explain what I'm doing. This video is long enough, so literally stick with me for 30 seconds and then I'll be gone. This year I want to do some longer videos that take me a bit longer to film where I read a series of books either in the same world or by the same author, preferably ones that I either have never read of this author before or or a really popular series that I've never read before or I'm thinking of doing rereads of series I loved when I was younger that I haven't read in a long time as well and I thought the perfect author to start off with would be Ali Hazelwood TikTok loves her I hear really good things about her so what you're about to watch is me embarking on Ali Hazelwood for the very first time I have never read an Ali Hazelwood book before now and in this video I read all of them including Bride which was just released like two weeks ago. Also this is your first and only warning that this video is going to be full of spoilers. I really hope you enjoy. <laughs> Hi so the first Ali Hazelwood I'm starting out with is The Love Hypothesis, the one that started it all. I'm about 34% in now so I'm just up to chapter 8. I'll give you a recap of what's happened so far. So this is about a woman called Olive who's doing a PhD in biology. She's got a specific interest in pancreatic cancer because her mum died from it. And her best friend on the course, Anne, fancies her ex-boyfriend but doesn't want to get with him. His name's Jeremy because she thinks it's breaking girl code and Olive has told her it's fine but Anne's like, no. She like basically doesn't believe that Olive's over him. Olive ends up getting into a fake relationship with one of the professors in her course called Adam. It's okay because he is not her supervisor. They don't really interact at all in the uni. <laughs> they pass the check by the dean. It's okay. But yeah, she ends up getting in a fake relationship with Adam in order to convince her best friend that she's completely over Jeremy so her best friend can go and date Jeremy and it's all good and they're going to continue this fake relationship in order to keep the charade up for another month or so and because Adam wants to look like he's in a committed relationship so the university gives him money that they've been holding back because they think he's a flight risk and he's gonna take their money and then do the research and then go off to another university and swap jobs and betray them basically. That's the gist of it at the point we're at just now. Nothing concrete has happened during this fake relationship other than like them being forced to touch in ways to convince her best friend that they're actually together. Like for example she had to sit on his lap during a lecture which was really bizarre and the bit I just read is she had to put sunscreen on him. All very tropey, but honestly, I'm enjoying it so much. It's so silly, but I think it's silly in a way I can get behind. Like Hazelwood's writing is, um, it's making me chuckle. There's some books that are written like this where I don't think the writing is that funny and I need it to be funny in order to be like, this is just, this is a good time. If it's not funny, then it just feels really cringe and ridiculous. And even though this is really cringe and ridiculous because it's funny, it's like, okay, yeah, I accept this. The tension between the two is good. Adam is clearly in love with Olive and has been since he first met her. And we kind of, we as a reader know that they have met before, but Olive doesn't realise that they've met before because she, her eyesight was incapacitated at the time. Adam is not well liked in the university as well. He is really harsh on his students, so that's getting a bit of backlash on Olive just now from her peers. I'm excited for things to start getting a bit steamier. I'm liking the pace it's going at right now. It's like not too slow burn, but also not too fast because I generally prefer a slow burn build up to feel like you've really earned the couple kind of getting to know each other on a more intimate level. I think it's so funny as well. Like obviously I've got into this knowing that this was based off a Kylo Ren fan fiction that the author wrote and published online before. And I looked it up last night because I was just curious and um, I found a PDF of it and it is pretty like much the exact same story, like word for word, just like names change and everything. But honestly, you can so tell. <laughs> can so tell that this main love interest, Adam, is Adam Driver. I'm not mad at it. You know, we take our influence 
from all around us in this world but it's just like it's kind of taken me out a bit knowing that because <laughs> while I'm reading I'm just thinking okay so who who is who in Star Wars terms because obviously there's Kylo Ren and Rey are the main characters and I, I was reading a chapter where Rey is talking to one of her best friends Malcolm and I was reading and reading and then I was like oh my god that's meant to be Finn and he's meant to fancy another professor in the uni who is meant to be Poe it was all coming together in my head in a magical way and I'm assuming, to be fair, I don't know who Jeremy is. Anne must be Rose. I'm not mad at it and I'm so excited that I'm enjoying it because I was really worried I was going to hate it. It's always a bit up in the air whether a romance writer is going to click with you or not because I think romance writers and readers' tastes have to kind of align so much more so than in other genres. But yes, I am enjoying it. I'm going to read a bit more now. This book is filled to the brim of literally every single trope you could posit positively think of and I'm unashamedly here for it. Like, there's been the, oh no, I have to sit on his lap trope. There's been the fig dating, obviously, all of these touches and now I'm pretty sure we've got an upcoming, to be confirmed, there was only one bed trope. I think that they're going to have to share a hotel room. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. It's like dying. This is so funny. <laughs> it's always one bed. So I'm like maybe between 50 and 60% through and I think things are about to get spicy. So I thought I'd make myself a wee gin and tonic with this Glaswegian raspberry and rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb gin, which I got from my friend in a secret Santa we did. Cheers. Oh, oh, that's lovely. Tom was giving me all vibes at the start of this book. At this point, he is just being flipping weird. Just downright weird. Um, so I'm sus of him, but I also have no idea where in the storyline this is going to be going. Like, he's going to backpedal on Olive's, his offer to Olive to go to Harvard next year. I don't know, but I don't like him. I don't like him at all. But I'm so excited for things to get interesting at this conference that they're at. I just finished Love Hypothesis and I'm so glad that I decided to read it finally. I honestly went into it not expecting to love it as much as I did. I was talking to Alex the other day about romance as a genre in books specifically and I think I'm qualified enough to say because I read quite a variety of genres that like I think finding authors who are right for you in a romance genre genre is so much more important than in any other genre because so I've read more than other genres more romance books that haven't worked for me because of writing styles etc this one really worked for me I could tell like that she has come from fan fiction but I I love fan fiction I'm not looking, not looking down on it at all I don't think it was perfect I'm not a big fan of miscommunication trope in general and this was very present in this book and it uh, Generally, it quite an it annoys me um, when main characters are miscommunicating with each other when it's not done like in a very convincing way and I think often it's not. I think in this book I was just especially like, you're just be both being blind idiots right now. And I also will say, this isn't a complaint necessarily, but I've heard a lot of people like hyping up this book and like the spice in this book and the spice was good. But there was only like two chapters of it. It wasn't very 
prevalent. It is there but there's just not that much of it really. They barely even, like apart from those two chapters, they barely even touch each other I think. That being said, I think the tension was built really nicely and I really liked both characters. I think maybe I, I get the hype over Adam Driver now as well because obviously I know that this was a Raylo fanfic. I just couldn't not picture Adam Driver as the main guy because it is so clearly him. Every description of him, his voice, his hair, his the moles on his skin, <laughs> like it was him. I've never gotten the hype for Adam Driver before. I've never not gotten it though, but I think maybe I get it now. It was good, a good one to start off with. I mean, I couldn't really start with any other. I think I had to go in to this video starting off with Love Hypothesis. I was gonna spread out reading these books and like, read some in between but I enjoyed this one so much that I might go straight into another one and I think if I'm not mistaken the next one she released was Love on the Brain. I'm pretty sure she did some novellas but I don't think I'm gonna read them. I think I'm gonna stick to her books rather than her shorter form content. <laughs> content rather than her novellas and short stories and then if I have fallen in love with her completely maybe I'll go back and read novellas but yeah I think I'm gonna just stick to the three main ones I don't know what love on the brain is about should I look it up okay another steminist rom-com I love that that's the other thing I really loved about it I love the kind of focus on the difficulty of being a woman working in science and the struggles of working in academia in general I just thought that was really well done in Love Hypothesis so I'm excited that that's going to be the case in Love on the Brain 2 I'm assuming all of Ali Hazelwood's books are STEM novels although so far because I know that this year, next month maybe, she's coming out with a supernatural book, which I'm assuming is not STEM, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay, yeah, I have heard about this one. This is the one where it's like enemies to lovers, two scientists are working together on a project. The woman is convinced when her project starts going wrong that the guy is sabotaging it, I think, but then he actually ends up helping her. Interesting. I think I'm gonna go straight into it. <laughs> <laughs> the next books I have to read are very intense but I'm really excited to read them but they're so intense that I keep putting it off even though I'm itching to read them. It's the Broken Earth trilogy. I read the first one just before Christmas and I got the other next two for Christmas and I have them on my shelves and I really want to read them because I love the first one but I just, I'm nervous basically. Uh, so I'm gonna read another Ellie Hazelwood I'm gonna do it and I'll maybe give you a 25% or 50% update once I'm into it, once I know the vibes, but I'm excited. I'm really, I enjoyed Love Hypothesis so much. <laughs> so sorry about any banging you can hear behind me or the fire. Alex is making us dinner right now. It's a bit disruptive, but I wanted to give a quick update. So I'm about 30% through Love on the Brain and I am loving it so much so that I was just kept putting off setting the camera up to like film me little reading clips or film any updates because I just wanted to keep reading it. I'm loving it so much more than Love Hypothesis and I enjoyed Love Hypothesis but this is so much more up my street I think. I love enemies to lovers. It's probably my favourite trope. I'll be honest. So this is doing all the right things for me. The bit I've just stopped at is I've just finished the chapter where she's gotten stuck in the graveyard when she's out for a run but the gates have been locked and she's had to call Levi to come rescue her and I'm so excited. I think that they're gonna bond maybe at this point. I think maybe she's gonna start to think oh maybe he doesn't find me disgusting, maybe he actually doesn't hate me, maybe he just has some issues that he's needing to work through personally. I'm loving the fact that they're talking online over Twitter without knowing it's each other. I think that's so so cute. Honestly I'm just like needing them to both figure out that neither of them are married. I don't think this child that is supposedly Levi's child is his child. I'm assuming that it's maybe his sister's child and his sister is the woman who's in the picture in his office. That is where I think it's going but yeah I'm loving it. I am loving it meeting up. I really like, I'm not sure how you pronounce her name, Rocio, I think. Bee's research assistant, she's really funny. She's a total goth and she's just so completely deadpan. And I keep laughing out loud as well at all the comments about engineers and how they're so difficult and hard to work with and blah, 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 because my husband, Alex, is an engineer. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, I've been reading it next to him laughing whenever they make a funny engineer comment and being like, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> but anyway, that is my quick 30%, around about 30% update. I am loving it. And I'm gonna go read some more tonight. I can't wait. So I finished Love on the Brain yesterday and it was near perfect for me. I was near giving it five stars. I don't usually say my star ratings in YouTube videos. I usually just rate it on Storygraph and like keep it just for myself because it happens so often that like the next day I'll change my mind or like even weeks later I'll see what I rated a book and I'll be like, that is not how I feel about it. Sometimes I need to mull an opinion over, you know what I mean? I was so close to giving Love on the Brain five stars but I gave it 4.5 because some of the word choice in it especially during the spicy scenes made me go <sighs> that being said it didn't happen often I thought the writing was so funny I loved B I loved Levi I loved their enemies to lovers relationship I mean honestly I don't know why I didn't expect me to love this book going into it because I read the synopsis. I knew it was going to be Enemies to Lovers, but the way she did it was just so my type of Enemies to Lovers where there are enemies, but like you can see the lovers from the start anyway still. Sometimes Enemies to Lovers are two enemies at the start, which I do enjoy too, but sometimes I'm just like give me a bit of loving to get into. This was miles better than the love hypothesis for me and I really enjoyed the love hypothesis but this just, the dynamic between the two was just exquisite. I loved the secondary characters of Rossio and Kaylee. I loved their relationship. I loved the... <laughs> I wish I'd been filming actually when I read this bit. The climax of this book was crazy absolutely wild this is a spoiler video so i'm just gonna say it when the gun comes up i was literally like jaw dropped book fell to my lap i was like is ali seriously going here making this cute little love story into some sort of like thriller <laughs> because that's literally what happened but honestly i was here for it it wasn't over dramatic for me i ate it up i was like oh my god she's gonna be forced to jump off this building i mean it was ridiculous but i was also like yeah i'd buy it <laughs> nasa scientists be crazy also the spice in this book was so much better there was more of it i thought it was better written despite weird word choices occasionally I just, I think I just felt it more between these two characters. I would just like believed it more than I did the love, uh, love hypothesis character. So I can't even remember the names of it anymore. Can I? Olive and Adam, cause Adam Driver, yes. So you best believe I finished that book and was like, well, I wish I could experience that again. So I, I jumped straight into love theoretically. I didn't even pause to give my immediate reaction on the book. Cause I was like, I, I can't right now. I may as well tell you what I rated love hypothesis since I've told you what I rated Love on the Brain now. I think I gave Love Hypothesis a 3.75 maybe, which is quite high for me. I'm quite a harsh rater. Like my rating system is that if I don't hate a book and I don't love it, then it's getting a 2.5 because that's in between one and five. But I know that a lot of people think that's crazy because 2.5 sounds really low. Like my sister thinks I'm psychotic. <laughs> but like, that's just my reasoning in my head 2.5 is like I'm never gonna think about this book again it didn't impact me and then three is maybe like I didn't love this book but I probably I really I did enjoy reading it and I will think about it again and then like it slowly gets up like five stars for me are rare like five stars are for all-time favorites like be all end all it's very rare so if I give a book four stars and above then I loved it and I gave Love on the Brain 4.5 so it's especially rare for me to give romances that even though I love reading romance sometimes I find it hard to rate them high because I think it's so easy for romances to do little things that will annoy you. I just think a perfect romance is really hard to come by and a perfect romance is so subjective depending on the person reading it. It's just like romance in real life, like so many people experience and show love in so many different ways. So of course it's going to affect the way you enjoy a certain romance book. So love theoretically, I'm quite far in, I'm not halfway through, I'm, I'm nearly halfway through. <laughs> I started this yesterday. <laughs> I'm 42% through. This 
is taking me the longest to get into but that's not to say I'm not enjoying it. I'm finding the male main love interest in this book the hardest to like. What's his name? Jack. I feel like he is, out of all three that I've read so far, the most hard to get to know, the most hard to read, which makes sense because she is saying in this book how hard she's finding it to read him. Because of that, I'm finding it hard to fancy him. And I like to fancy the the love interest and the books I'm reading, it gets me into it, you know what I mean? That being said, I'm liking that he is offering a different take on the other two love interests. He does clearly like her a lot and has liked her from the start, but the way it's written and his interactions with her, I can understand more than the other two women I've read why she would think that he hates her. He's shown much more antagonistic than the other two. So this enemies to lovers is much more believable as an enemies to lovers than say love on the brain because I actually do feel like, yeah, I get why they hate each other. What's her name? Oh, what's her name? <laughs> all of these romances are getting mixed up. Elsie. I like Elsie too. Again, she is very different from the last two main characters, I think. I think the last two are quite similar. I think that Ali Hayeswood gets a lot of criticism for like copy and pasting and kind of reusing the same ideas and the same relationship models and everything. And I, I do see that. I think she has done a better job in this book of trying something new. I feel like this book is going way more in depth than the other two into characterization, the fact that Elsie struggles with being her true self in front of people and she puts on these different masks and personas. I like that Jack's seeing through that. I think out of all the books this is the most interesting dynamic but it's still not beating Love on the Brain for me. I'm finding this book not to be as funny. I thought Love on the Brain was really funny. It all could change. It all could change. The scene that's just happened is Jack has basically confessed to Elsie that he fancies her. And he's fancied her from the start but he didn't want to say anything and he was struggling because he thought that she was dating his brother which she was but it was fake because like i said <laughs> ali hazelwood copies and paste <laughs> the various tropes she uses into the new book she's writing and i'm not hating on her for it i'm actually oh i'm so glad that i've decided to do this ali hazelwood reading experience right before she's coming out with in february her first paranormal romance oh hey can you see sienna i think that's going to be so interesting so interesting because these are so contemporary romances the way she writes is so contemporary romance and i just i want to see whether she's going to stick with the same kind of chatty writing style in her upcoming paranormal book or if she's going to go more into like serious writing style who knows but anyway that is just my update because i hadn't updated in so long I, i'm already nearly halfway through another book i love love on the brain that is my favorite so far i definitely could see myself rereading it in the future okay <laughs> I just finished Love Theoretically and I loved it. I, yeah. This was a grower, not a shower. This was definitely the most emotionally impactful one of Ali Hazelwood that I've read so far. Like the other two were kind of just like fun romps and this was a fun romp, but the emotions that it elicit elicited from me were extremely intense. I think a large part of that was to do with Elsie's character and the fact that like a big part of her character is that she is like a people pleaser and she really struggles with saying no to people and being her true self in the fear that she'll be rejected and won't be loved for herself and I think that is just so relatable to a lot of people, me included. It just felt very real and I could feel every single one of her emotions so viscerally. I just feel like I really connected to her character the most out of every character of Ali's 
Hazelwood so far. I also think this was the most authentic enemies to lovers story I think I've ever read and I say that because it's not my favourite enemies to lovers I've ever read but I think it's maybe the most enemies to lovers I've ever read even over like some fantasy books and stuff like that where they truly are like enemies enemies where like I'll kill you enemies and I say this because a lot of the times in enemies to lovers I go into it and I love the enemy character from the get-go, effective immediately. I love the kind of tension that like the antagonist relationship brings to everything. And so I often find myself enjoying reading it, but constantly turning the page, waiting for the penny to drop for the main character to realise that like, this guy isn't perfect, but she is falling in love with him and she's having to reconcile her conflicting feelings. But I've already been there from the start. This book, I can't think of another enemies to lover story where like I have been with the main character when she hates the guy at the start and I've been with her as she has the moment where she's like, oh, maybe I don't hate him and maybe I actually like him a bit and maybe I'm falling in love with him. I was with her every step of the way because I don't think Jack was likeable at all at the beginning. I didn't see the appeal and I thought this was maybe going to be my least favourite one of Ali Hazelwood's books but she brought it home. She brought it home. It was so good. The journey we went on, the subject matter was so well handled, surprisingly serious very emotional. I just thought it was brilliant and I think I'm going to rate it 4.5 stars on par with Love on the Brain. I think Love on the Brain was a more fun like giggly read and Love theoretically is a more emotional angsty read. Do you know what I mean? Both good for different moods. I can't rate it full 5 stars because again there was some weird word choice in the spicy scenes. <laughs> which I couldn't get behind. And I also didn't like The Spice as much as Love on the Brain. I have a lot of respect for Ali Hazelwood of like pulling off this enemies to lovers arc in which I truly didn't like Jack at the start. And I didn't see myself liking him. I didn't find him attractive. I didn't find him that funny. I didn't find him likeable. And now I'm happy that they end up together. I've also been thinking a lot about like, what is it about Ali Hazelwood's writing that I'm enjoying so much. Because like I've been saying, I think romance as a genre is especially subjective to people because people love in very different ways and want to be loved in very different ways, show love in very different ways. And I feel like that translates into romance and whether you're gonna like a specific romance or not. But I was thinking about this and I am not a scientist at all. I was not into science at school. I'm not very good at maths. Like I was very much into English drama, <laughs> music. The arts was where I was at, not the sciences. I love how much of the STEM academic world is included in these stories because it feels like when I'm reading these romances I'm actually invested in the science plot lines and learning about what they're doing and oftentimes I'm not fully understanding what they're talking about but it's like written in such a fresh way it's just making science really fun to me someone who has never really got the whole thing of science being a fun thing. And I think it's really a testament because a lot of the romance books I read, I don't really care about anything out with the main relationship between the two characters. That's why I'm reading a romance. I want to see two characters develop and grow into better people, both individually and as a couple because of each other. That's what I like in a romance. I'm not too bothered about the outside factors as long as that's the strong bit. But in Ali Hazelwood's books, I am so flippin' invested in these gals' science academic careers. I want them to succeed so much. Oh my god, speaking of like succeeding and how emotional this book was, when I think the moment I realised the turning point for me in this book was when Elsie finds out she hasn't got the job and the way it was written I was just I felt the heartbreak in that moment for her 
I felt the hatred for Jack whilst at the same time beginning to see that he d does care about her but it was so conflicted. I just I, like I don't there, it's just so rare that I have an experience reading where a scene like that I can really fully empathise with the character so much that I'm feeling the emotions. You know what I mean? I find when I'm watching films and TV shows I get much more emotionally invested than when I'm reading books. I find it much rarer, although I love reading, it's just it's rarer I have that kind of emotional reaction. Like my adrenaline was pumping man. It was excellent. Excellent. Loved it. I just, I wasn't expecting that. I really thought when I read Love on the Brain that was going to be my top. I think Love on the Brain is still my top, but I just thought that Love Theoretically was, I was emotionally in, do you know what I mean? And like reading these two books and now thinking about the Love Hypothesis, which obviously I did enjoy, I'm just like, that was so clearly the worst one so far. Like it doesn't even compare. And that's fair enough because that was the first book she wrote. I'm not saying that it was bad by any means, but like, it's just you can see the improvement so much. I've got Check and Mate to read, which is going to be interesting because it is a young adult book, her first young adult book. So I think I'm going to read that next. And then I think I'm going to read the collection of, I think it's three short stories, also STEM. I haven't decided when I'm posting this video, but Bride comes out very soon. And I think I might read it as soon as it comes out. So I might just include Bride in this video too and then I'll have read everything she's published. And you'll get my uh, initial reactions to her first paranormal romance as well, which will be fun. Okay, I need to go get some work done now. <laughs> but I had to finish the book this morning. I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to focus on anything else. Hi, so as of today, the 1st of February, I am now up to date on all of Ali Hazelwood's current releases. I didn't update on Check and Me or the three novellas she wrote, which I read within Loath to Love You, just because I read them at a weekend and I was just in it, you know, I was just in the zone. So I'm gonna bring us all up to speed now on where I'm at with Ali Hazelwood's books. Starting with Check and Mate, which is her first and only young adult novel about a girl called Mallory who is really good at chess, could have been grandmaster level good, but she stopped playing at 14 because of some sort of trauma to do with her dad, which we don't know about at the start of the book. So now Mallory's 18, her dad's not in the picture, her mum has a chronic illness, I think, and she is basically looking after her family, which is her mum and her two younger sisters, but she's struggling with money. Her best friend is leaving for university and she feels like she's getting left behind and she loses her job. And then she realises that if you're really, really good at chess and you win lots of competitions, you can actually earn a really good living from it. So she re-enters the chess world and meets the number one world chess champion called Nolan, who is immediately obsessed with her after she beats him at this non-consequential charity chess event. And throughout the book, Mallory basically starts to fall for Nolan whilst at the same time is falling back in love with chess. Even though she's trying to keep chess at a distance, she wants to treat it just like a job. She doesn't want to get sucked back into the world again because of said trauma. I really liked this book. I rated it 3.5 stars, which is quite good. For a young adult romance, it was actually quite mature, like both emotionally and with how they deal with more mature subjects like sex. Sex is talked about a lot and explored a lot, just not in such explicit terms that you would find in Ali Hazelwood's other books. This was her first non-STEM book as well, but I am glad that she stuck with a subject matter that was clearly important to her. At the end of the book, there's a wee author's note that has her explaining like why she wanted to write it about a paper, an academic paper she read about a uh, woman in chess and the misogyny in the chess world. There's a fact in the book that was crazy to me. A research study did it. I'm not sure when it was, like maybe the 80s or something. They got a group of women and they got called in and were asked to play 
various games of chess and were told that in some games they were playing against men, in some games they were playing against women, in some games they were playing against computers and they found that when the women were playing against women uh, they were winning like 50% of the time, when the women were playing against computers they were winning 50% of the time but when the women were playing against men the percentage of wins for them was lowered even though in reality they were playing against the same thing or person every time. The point being that because of like misogyny and the patriarchy and everything, women if they think they're playing against a man they will underperform which is crazy um, and that is mentioned in the book and at the end of the book in the author's note Ali Hazelwood says that that is a fact that she read that research study. So stuff like that I really like. I like that she kept, even though it wasn't a STEM book, she kept those kind of like learning opportunities within this book and she was still exploring like struggles of being a woman in the workplace but just in a different environment. I'm thinking about it now and I think this book is better than The Love Hypothesis but I rated Love Hypothesis higher, I rated that 3.75 and this 3.5 but I'm thinking about it now and I think that this is better because I think the characters background stories, I think their motivations are much more concrete and have more depth. This is why I don't like rating books because I switch so easily. I think Ali did a really good job at uh, exploring all the different emotions um, a teenager at 18 who's just left high school will be feeling like all of these scared feelings about being left behind by your friends, about if you're a carer having to sacrifice aspects of your childhood. She explores like like how childhood drama can make someone place blame on themselves a lot of the time really well. I think this is a really, really good young adult novel, actually. Uh, I really, really liked it. Nolan as a love interest was really lovely. Her sisters, well one of her sisters is a bitch, but the other one is really fun. I was angry towards the end of the book when her family kind of turns against her and are being like, you don't have to act like the mum, your cooking sucks and we wish you would just leave. <laughs> They didn't say that, but that was kind of like what it felt like to me. I think I was completely on Mallory's side for that because she was like doing everything for everyone and getting no thanks for it. And the minute she loses her temper, her mum starts acting like a mum again. And I'm not saying like, I know the reason why her mum couldn't be properly there is because of her illness, but also like have a bit of empathy you know, her sister as well. I know her sister is like 14 and is going through all of like puberty and everything and is just naturally angry, but also like, shut up. <laughs> I'm saying that because I was like that at 14. I was horrible, <laughs> so. And I think towards the end, it did start to fall flat for me when we get to the whole like drama that evolves between Mallory and Nolan. So now that I'm thinking about it, actually, I'm happy with my rating. Overall, a solid YA. Then finally, I read her three novellas in the Low to Love You collection. The first one being Under One Roof, which follows Mara and Liam. Mara is a environmental scientist whose PhD professor and friend has died and they were super close. So she left Mara a house in her will. Mara goes to the house realizes that she was only left half the house and the other half is actually belongs to Liam, Mara's nephew who lives in the house currently. Mara moves in despite Liam's clear opposition to this and then they fall in love. And this one was cute, a bit unbelievable and I don't usually care about that but I spent like the first quarter of it like completely just like so focused in on the fact that she was left half a house. Like is that, how does that work? I know nothing about houses to be fair or wills. <laughs> so I'm sure like 
it is something that could happen but it just seems crazy to me and also seems crazy the idea that she would move in I mean it is like explained away as she just needs somewhere to live it's a nice house there's enough space and I get that but also I would never move in with a random man that I hadn't met before that seems terrifying to me it's kind of alluded to halfway through the story that the PhD professor who died had been trying to set up Mara with loads of people and her nephew with loads of people and this was probably like her last way of trying to set them up with each other which makes sense but I just I, I would never move in with someone I didn't know it was really sweet though and I think this was my second favorite out of the three novellas then we have stuck with you which follows Sadie and Eric who have this 24 hour love affair when they meet randomly one morning outside of work they're both engineers who work in the same building but for different companies but their relationship comes to a swift end when Sadie realizes that Eric has taken information that she disclosed to him on their date and used it to steal a client from their company and the story flits between a 20 minute time period where they have gotten stuck in an elevator just the two of them together and showing the 24 hour love affair that they had and then the res resolution of their angst with each other. This was my least favourite one. I didn't find Eric that attractive and I think Sadie was the least interesting of the three women to me. I liked the concept of it. I liked jumping between present and past that have led up to this moment, but I just found the the problem that kept them apart was a bit too obvious for me and yeah I just didn't really I didn't really see it between the two of them so I think this actually might be my least favorite Ali Hazelwood couple interestingly enough and then the third and final one was my favorite out of the three novellas it was Below Zero and it followed Hannah and what was the guy's name? Ian. <laughs> they met one afternoon when Hannah was interviewing him for a project in her PhD where she interviews someone within the career that she wants to do. He works for NASA and she's dreamt of working for NASA. And during this interview they hook up when Ian wants to take her out for dinner and she's like, no, 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 I don't date. <laughs> that it's not for me so he's like okay well just let me know if you change your mind because I want to date you and then they part ways for is it four years basically until she finishes her PhD gets a job at NASA and then on her first day Ian is there still working there comes directly over to her everything's good he's friendly they're getting on like a house on fire still then she goes off to an arctic research station for a project for like six months so they don't see each other after that comes back then she has another project up for funding that she really wants to do to go back to the arctic arctic research station she doesn't get permission to do the project she finds out that ian is the one on the board who refused to let her do the project and when she confronts him about it he says yeah because it's too dangerous but he was the only one who said no because it's a really good project for nasa so the rest of the board was like we don't care about the danger she can go and do it anyway she eventually gets funding from another means to go do this gets in a sticky situation out there and Ian turns up and saves her life basically and then she realizes she wants to date him after all I just really liked this one I think it was the most original story out of the three I really liked the kind of years long pining I liked Ian as a character kind of like shy guy um, I like the mortal peril situation. It was really exciting. So yeah, this one was my favourite out of the three. Overall, it was a good wee collection. If you like Ali Hazelwood, you'll definitely like these three short stories. I think I maybe would have enjoyed them if I wasn't reading all of Hallie, Ali Hazelwood's books like in a winner. I feel like these would have been really nice when she hadn't written much yet and you were getting these novellas to kind of tide you over until the next big story. But I will say that I think generally her writing is better when she She's focusing on one couple for a longer book rather than a novella. I think it just helps to have a bit more time to kind of get to know the characters and build up to the relationships. Her writing is just so accessible and so easy to read, so fast paced. 
and fun and interesting. And so yeah, that's me up to date now. I am going to include Bride in this video though when it comes out. So is that next week it comes out, I think? It's February 1st today. I think it's next week. And I'm really excited because it is going to be very different. It's not going to be STEM, obviously. It's paranormal romance between a werewolf and a vampire, I think. I can't not include it. It's like le doing this video has lined up so perfectly with it that I definitely want to include it. So, Bride is out. I have started it. I'm 31% through, so it's time for an update. I'm going to talk you through what's happened so far, and then I'm going to give you my initial thoughts and feelings. So in this book, our main character is Misery, and the book starts off with a prologue. She's a vampire who's getting married to a werewolf in an arranged marriage situation. They've never met before, they've never seen each other before, but she is being kind of forced into this marriage in order to prevent a war from breaking out between vampires and werewolves. In this world there's vampires, werewolves and humans and they try to stay as separate as possible. Misery is the daughter of like the head of the vampires basically and the werewolf she's marrying is the head of the werewolves, the alpha, and he has been newly appointed in this position. So basically what we know just now is that Misery wasn't going to go ahead with the marriage until she heard the name of the werewolf that she would be marrying. His name is Lo... Oh, what's his name? It's quite important actually. Moreland? It begins with an... Moreland? Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> when she hears his name, she's like, okay, I'll marry him. And we later learn that that is because her best friend slash adoptive sister, who is a human, has gone missing. The only clue Misery has linking to her disappearance is a piece of paper in her best friend who's called Serena's flat, which has the name L.E. Moreland on it? The second name of the werewolf, which I can't remember right now. So she agrees to this marriage so she can find Serena. On the other side of this couple, we have Lo, the werewolf. The drama with him is that he took the position of alpha from the previous alpha called Roscoe but there's a group of werewolves who aren't happy with that and are still faithful to Roscoe who's dead now anyway and are called loyalists or loyals and they're basically against Lo. Meanwhile Lo has a younger half sister who's like six years old but the controversy with her is that she's half werewolf half human which only a couple of people know about because that's very taboo. He wanted to go ahead with this marriage to kind of form an alliance with the vampires and quell any war occurring between the two species because there's been a lot of deaths caused by their differences and their hatred towards each other. The last time a vampire and werewolf tried to get married, a massacre occurred during the wedding ceremony, which is referred to as the Aster, because <laughs> vampire's blood is purple and werewolf's blood is green. And the mixture of the two bloods that were spilled on that day was reminiscent of the flower, the Aster, which is purple and green. Uh, that's a bit far-fetched for me. What else is happening? Is there any more plot that I need to catch you up on? The other thing that is important to note is that Misery has to spend at least a year living in werewolf territory with her husband and in turn a werewolf has gone over to the vampire territory to live there for a year and they're acting as kind of like collateral to ensure misery isn't hurt and what and war doesn't break out and everything. This isn't the first time something like this has happened because what's important to know is that there is a new governor within the humans as well. The old governor had an arrangement with the vampires that they would kind of be allies against the werewolves so that their numbers and strength lined up and their alliance was based on the contingency that a child vampire will be sent to live with the humans and a child human will be sent to live with the vampires until they're of age and then they can go back home and another child is picked and so on and so on. When Misery was wee, she was the child who went over to live with the humans, which is how she got her adoptive sister, Serena. That's how that happened. So Misery is going through a lot. Misery thinks that the werewolf who has been sent over in her place to act as collateral is her husband's mate based on things she heard while eavesdropping. Now my theory so far is that 
it's not his mate, that misery is his mate, based on the clear signs <laughs> that are being laid out for us. I think that the werewolf has been, who has been sent over is one of the other pack members' mate, because there was a little, a little line which alluded to that, but misery is obviously clueless. That's where we're at plot-wise. Relationship-wise between misery and low, we've not developed much at 30% through. They barely spent any time with each other. Mainly what we've been learning so far is just Misery's background, who she is as a character. She's been bonding with Lo's little sister, who is the half-human. Oh, who we've just realised and found out that is actually who Serena's note was probably referring to because her name is Liliana Ellis second name which I can't remember. So yeah, romance wise we don't have a lot going on but they are clearly mates or at least that is where it looks like it's going. There's just constant reference to low sniffing. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this. Um, misery. He's a, he, he's obsessed with her scent. The way misery is interpreting it is that he hates her scent and she smells bad to him. But obviously as a reader, knowing that this is a paranormal romance, you're like, no, he's a bit too into it. But we're getting there romance wise. I think something's gonna have to give soon based on where we are in the book and plot because we've just gotten to a moment where Lo has basically decided to trust Misery and has told him about his half-sister being half-human, half-werewolf. Am I enjoying it? <sighs> I am a bit bored so far. Unlike with her previous books, I'm not like itching to keep reading. I do keep setting it down and going off to do different things, which is a bit annoying. That being said, I am intrigued to see where the story is going to take us. Because Ali Hazelwood is such a strong romance writer, I just need to see what she brings to like a paranormal romance book. Is it going to be spicier? Is it going to be a different kind of spice? Writing style wise, she's stayed pretty similar to her previous contemporary romance novels, which I don't hate but I don't love either. Because she's not writing about STEM, which obviously she has loads of degrees in, I feel like when you read her STEM books you can tell that this is something she's passionate about, knows inside out, that she's comfortable writing in, whereas because she can rely on that in this narrative it's like completely new. I don't feel as comfortable reading it as I did with her other stuff. I don't feel like that she's as confident. I'm hoping I start enjoying it more. It could be a case of that like I'm just not a big fan of paranormal romance. Uh, I don't really read that much paranormal romance to be honest. I don't know why, I just, I always tend to go towards more fantasy or like sci-fi rather than paranormal. But that's pretty much where we're at. I am not loving it so far. Definitely my least favourite of her work so far. But it's so different. Maybe I just need to adjust, you know, maybe, maybe I'm just getting used to the altitude, you know? We'll see. So, I finished Bride. I want to say about just under a week ago. And I'm only just now doing my review because I need to take some time to mull over some thoughts. I'm going to be honest, I rated this book 2.5 stars. The lowest rated Ali Hazelwood so far. And I wanted to take some time to think over why I didn't like this book as much as the other ones. I wasn't sure if it was just because I'm not a par paranormal romance girly or if I just genuinely didn't enjoy it and I think I have come to realise that I just genuinely didn't enjoy it. It didn't really connect to any of the characters. The romance wasn't doing it for me. I just didn't see the tension between the two at all really. Spice wasn't very good. I think what happened is what makes Ali Hazelwood's romance, contemporary romance writing so good is that she draws on her knowledge of science and STEM and struggles of being a woman in a male dominated field. All really, really interesting 
topics and discussions and a really important point of view to have and she explores them in such an effective way because she's using the romance genre to discuss these themes and issues. You can feel her knowledge and passion about this like jumping off the page. It's just her writing is so engaging in those books because of her background within the world and everything and her obvious experience with all of these issues. And then you had the same in Check and Mate as well. She obviously was really interested in the chess world and the issues for women within that space, even though she, I think, doesn't really know how to play chess, going off what she said at the end of the book in her author's notes. But that didn't matter. Like, the fact that she didn't play chess didn't matter because you could still feel her interest in the world jumping off the page. The issue with the paranormal romance is we didn't have any of that passion that she has in something coming off the page, I didn't feel. And that's not to say that like, you can't write about things that you, you don't know. I think Ali Hazelwood must really enjoy reading paranormal romance. She likes the kind of relationship dynamic that arises between two people in a paranormal romance. She maybe likes the tropes that come with a paranormal romance, but you can't write a book or a story just because you want to write in that genre. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's what she did. She wanted to write in this so subgenre of romance because she enjoys writing it. And she went in with like key elements that she wanted to hit, but she didn't go in with a story she necessarily wanted to tell. That may be a really harsh thing to say. Um, that's just how it felt reading to me compared with our other books in which I could feel like she wanted to tell these stories, she had something to say. That is my takeaway from Bride. Just overall disappointed, I'm afraid. It's been less than a week and I can barely remember what happened in it as well, which isn't very good. There was a whole like plot twist at the end that her dad was the cause of all the issues that were going on. I all just felt a bit convoluted and honestly I was a bit lost as well. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It just it just all felt a bit messy. Yeah. Sorry. The conclusions to take away from my experience reading Ali Hazelwood is I think she is such a good writer. I really thoroughly enjoyed her books. I'll definitely be reading probably everything she comes out with. I would even give another paranormal romance or a different genre a try from her because like I understand it's so difficult writing in a completely different subgenre and it was her first go so like I would be up for reading another more out of left field book from her but I definitely have learned that with her writing she really shines when she's writing about something that she is truly passionate about in the real world that she is able to translate into her writing. She thrives when she goes in with a specific story she wants to tell about a character rather than like going in being like, I want to tell an enemies to lovers romance. It's better when she goes in being like, I want to tell a story about a young woman who feels like she has to fight for her place in science amongst all these men and she's going to fall in love while doing it. I'm just really unsure about paranormal romance now. If you have any good paranormal romance suggestions that are better than Bride, that I might enjoy more, that could like maybe give me more of an insight into the genre and what I'm missing from the genre, then please let me know. Also, if there are any book series that you think would be good for a longer video like this, let me know. I think the next one I'm gonna do is the Shatter Me series. I can't remember what the author's name is, but they were really big on booktube when I was a teenager, but I never read them. And now obviously with TikTok, they've gotten really big again. And I think it's time that I see what's going on with those books. But yeah, I'm very much open for suggestions because there's a lot of really beloved series that I've not read or authors as well that I've not read. I've barely dipped into Tessa Bailey. I've read one Tessa Bailey book, so definitely may do a video focused on Tessa Bailey. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video and enjoyed watching me discover Ali Hazelwood for the first time. Thank you for coming along on it with me. I definitely can say that 
I am a Ali Hazelwood fan now. I hope that you have an amazing upcoming week and I will see you in the next one. Bye! Okay.